This photograph is a uh, overview of most of the MLP, Mobile Launcher Platform, engineering camera positions as viewed from the fixed service structure looking down. This position is actually, uh, there's a view, I can't remember right off the top of my head which camera position is on the FSS, probably Echo 42 looking down on the vehicle. With the vehicle gone, you can see all of our engineering or most of our engineering camera positions on the MLP. Uh, interestingly enough, you can see a lot of the rust and corrosion damage around the openings for the, particularly where the SRBs would be affixed. Uh, this image is probably taken uh, within a day or so of launch. That corrosion happens that quick. Uh, the, the intense uh, heat and blast from launch strips away all the paint down to bare metal, and that corrosion, uh, it coupled with the water deluge system, which is probably fairly corrosive, starts that rusting process right away. And they go right into, post-launch, they go right into a refurb uh, mode and, and refurbish this right away. In this image, what you're looking at is uh, an overall view of the vehicle sitting on the MLP with the FSS and the RSS. It's actually a great shot. Um, we actually have one of our documentary cameras in this vicinity during, during launch, which is a spectacular image. But anyway, you can see uh, the different FSS fixed uh, service structure items pointed out uh, uh, on the upper portion of that structure. The short range trackers and perimeter cameras are all inside the fence, the uh, perimeter fence on the shuttle complexes. There's three tracking sites where we have remotely controlled Kineto tracking mounts, and that's at camera site one, two, and six. Camera sites three and four, we have engineering cameras just sitting on uh, pedestals. And then all throughout the inside of the fence are documentary cameras 
down in the grass on the different camera sites uh, up on the structure. But that is all considered our short range imagery. The request of NASA after the Columbia disaster was to give them three usable views, one from a short range, one from a medium range, and then one from a long range to cover from liftoff all the way out through uh, loss of view, and this is our short range. Uh, also from this view you can see this is Complex 39A where we finished out the shuttle program. In the background uh, you can see Complex 39B. It has a shuttle sitting on it and this would have been when we did the Hubble resurfacing mission. They had a shuttle on the other pad ready for a rescue mission if need be. Uh, the next slide is our, our mid-range. We've covered the short-range camera sites. Now we have our mid-range camera sites and we did our best to try to circle the pad. You notice we got three to the south and uh, two to the north. The one you see out by the shuttle landing facility is there in case they have to do a return to launch site, RTLS. It doesn't really track the launch itself but is there just to uh, cover the landing if need be. Uh, these five camera sites for the short range all shoot uh, 150 inch lenses with film and then we have a HD item for the quick look on each tracker. The long range camera sites are there to cover um, booster separation and then all the way out to loss of view which sometimes could be up to six minutes on a good clear day. Um, we have two to the north which you, if you could see Ponce Inlet is 100 miles or so by, by car to, to tow the tracker up there and then we come back down the beach to Apollo Beach and then down to the south we have Cocoa Beach and Patrick Air Force Base. All of these telescopes are huge. They're in the 400 inch range for the film item and then the 150 inch item uh, lens for the uh, HD item. A lot of these sites don't acquire until about plus 45 seconds when they've cleared all the ground scatter and, and got above the horizon to where we could even see it. But they're committed from anywhere from 70 seconds all the way out through loss of view. In this slide, you can see our storage of our lenses that we use on all of the tracking mounts. We store everything in a hangar on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Everything is brought into this hangar. The lenses go back on the shelf. We keep them uh, environmentally controlled so they uh, don't sweat and heat and grow mold. And we stage all of our operations out of here. And this is just a shot showing. You can see some IR cameras, some long lenses, telescopes, different items that would be used on, on multiple launch vehicles. Uh, the next slide is part of our warehouse where we store all of our cameras, our magazines, and some of our short lenses. Uh, you can see on the carts where we, we ready each camera by group to, to the items to where they're going. We'll have a whole set of, of carts for short range and then we'll deploy those out to the field and in the mid range. And we also have all the magazines that have to go through servicing and cleaning and, and then they load the film prior to taking them out into the field. This picture is Hangar G. And this is where we stage all of our photo assets for tracking. Uh, in, the, in the building behind what you see in this picture, actually part of this picture, is all the lenses and the cameras are stored inside in the air conditioning and environmentally controlled room. And these are all the trackers. You see a row of IFLOTs down the middle and the KTMs on both sides. And then something I haven't talked much about, these trailers that look like cargo trailers and there's one over with windows on the right hand side. These are our mobile control rooms. These trailers house all of the HD video recording and control electronics that we use out on the remote tracking sites. We use Cubis recorders and Panasonic camera controllers. We have time inserters, we have GPS units to provide timing if we, if we don't have timing at the site. Uh, but this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good shot of a lot of our equipment staged in one place.
what we're looking at here is the subject's view. If you're if you were the carrier plate looking back at the camera position of one of our TSM cameras, I, I can't tell if this is Echo 21 or 22. There's there's no reference here, but it's it's kind of interesting because uh, we talked earlier about the transition to LED style par lamps, and the upper lamp is that lamp that that we were discussing as compared to uh, an old style incandescent in the bottom. So we've got both in this photograph. We probably made this image when we were doing the transition. So the camera would actually be located in that white square area in the very center with the round five inch port. That's its position. And that, that position is purged with nitrogen to keep it uh, uh, non-explosive. Uh, and then there's the two lights. What we're looking at here is a close-up view of our engineering camera enclosure on the MLP. You see the outer steel box, half-inch steel box, enclosing the half-inch aluminum box in the interior. And what you're looking at is one of our uh, photosonic 16-millimeter engineering cameras. It does not have a film magazine on it. Where that black uh, anodized aluminum-looking portion is, that's, that's where the magazine would go. This internal aluminum box is pressurized with uh, 7 PSI nitrogen purge. You can see the inlet in the very back of the box. Uh, once this box is sealed, and you can see the, the uh, orange, reddish orange gasket where the door would sit, and you can actually see the openings for the, for the fasteners that fasten the door in position. That seals the box, and then that purge continually runs uh, so that this enclosure is completely ex explosion proof at that point. This is an incredibly violent environment, so that requires all of that, all of that hardware to, to make the camera survive. This photograph is one of our documentary still enclosures on the right-hand side, kind of looking through the port. It kind of shows it, it, its uh, point of view looking at the orbiter as the orbiter would pass through. A still camera would be in this enclosure, of course the back is open, showing you the mount where the digital still camera would be affixed. Uh, and that camera is fired through the POC system, the photo optical control system, sequentially. It's going to run probably five frames per second through liftoff and it would, uh, the, the vehicle would go right through the field of view of the camera. And that's how that image is made. Well, what we have here on the next slide is a, a view from camera site two of the shuttle pad. Obviously, there's no space shuttle sitting there or a mobile launch platform. But what this shows is the various camera platforms, pedestals that we call, um, that we put cameras on. A couple of them have the environmental enclosures. Uh, there's one in the, in the far right, you see, that's a pan and tilt video camera. It's used for... Uh, surveillance of, you know, if anybody wants to look at a valve or anything in particular, they can slew that around and look at it real time. But just a typical camera site, one of five that surround the uh, inside perimeter of the launch pad. The next shot is, it's actually a post-launch. Uh, this is a couple hours after a liftoff. We've gone back in to retrieve film. And the sun was setting. And this is a high dynamic range processed. Uh, just shows a couple camera boxes with the, the uh, spotlight shining on a, a now vacant pad where the shuttle was just lifted off from it. I thought it was a pretty good shot. Here we have. Uh, Two of our uh, instrumentation technician, uh, Don Kite and Tony Gray, setting up a digital still camera as a documentary item for uh, one of the space shuttle launches. Uh, we're at camera site two. We have a tracker, and you can see the camera boxes on there. We do, we do multiple engineering items on pedestals, but we also do the documentary items on pedestals as well. And they're just setting it up and getting it ready for launch. slide here is uh, our lead photographer Rick Weatherington. He's setting up the cameras prior to launch. 
Again, we go through and we, we test all of the, the lens operations. Because these, these cameras are remotely started, the exposures on them are also remotely controlled, uh, computer controlled. There's no human interaction to it. So, but we go through and we, we have the computer system send starts, send different f-stops, and uh, we check the cameras out. And the last thing we do is, is load the film magazine on and then close the covered wagon there and prepare for launch. And that's what Rick's doing. He's going through all his checks. And uh, once, we call it green lining. Once everything is ready, we call it into our uh, photo planner. We say this item is green lined which means it's ready for launch, it's in launch configuration, and we're, we can walk away from it. This slide here is another one of our remote camera trackers. It is the only remote tracker that is outside of the uh, perimeter fence. It's on a camera site that's right on the beach, uh, but it's still close enough that we cannot man this site. We have to remotely operate it. What you see here is on the top is a standard def camera with a wide angle lens that we, we kind of use to see the world with. That's our, our overall uh, lens that sees everything. Underneath in the middle is your HDTV and if you notice it's rotated counterclockwise 45 degrees again to allow the orbiter to fill the frame in that 16 by 9 format. Underneath the uh, covers on the tops on both the left and right are uh, one's a 35 millimeter film camera, high-speed film. The other is a Canon 7D with a, probably about a 500 mil lens we use for documentary stills. All of these cameras are started remotely and uh, after launch we will go out to this site and retrieve the film, but it's a pretty good site. Uh, this shot here is, is uh, it's an IFLOT tracker. It's an intermediate focal length optical tracker. Uh, these, believe it or not, were World War II anti-aircraft mounts way back in the day, and they converted them after the war to camera trackers, and we still use them. They were used throughout the entire Apollo program. They tracked every one of the moon missions, and now they have gone all the way through the space shuttle program. So they've been around a long time, and they, they still work pretty good. Again, what you see here on the, on the mount is HDTV on your left on a 150-inch lens, and on your right-hand side is 35 millimeter on the same 150 inch lens. What you see on the top is a HDTV with a COTS uh, lens made by Canon. It is rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise and that gives us a vertical field of view which this close to the pad. We're only 1.98 miles from the pad at this site. Uh, and this allows us to, to fill the frame with, with the shuttle and with that vertical view. What we have in this slide is uh, another Kineto tracking mount, but a lot more involved. You can see we, we are hanging a lens underneath, and the lens on the right is really huge. It's a 180-inch Perkin-Elmer lens with a doubler on it. I think the effective focal length on this particular one is about 396 inches. It's, it's quite a lens. On the left of the picture, the one on top is a 150-inch Brashear telescope. It has an HD camera behind it. Hanging underneath is a 100 inch telescope and it has a 70 millimeter film camera behind it. So we've got three different formats, 70 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film, and HDTV. The scopes in the middle again are the same as the tracking scopes. They're not recorded, they're just used by the operator to uh, track the object. The square box right underneath the tracking scopes in the center is the actual operator control console. That's where the operator will start his cameras uh, he can adjust the gain of his uh, the drive of the mount, and there's a joystick on there that we actually use to track the objects with. On this tracker here, it's it's south of the launch pad, probably 15 miles. It's a long-range tracker. Uh, we've got three different formats of recording here. We've got a 35 millimeter film on your left, with a 180-inch lens that's doubled. You can see the doubler uh, in the tube between the camera and the lens. On the right up top is a HD TV camera behind a 150 inch lens and you notice the camera is rotated 45 degrees to the right and what that allows is to get more of the orbiter in the frame with the 16 by 9 format of the HD TV. We just rotate it just enough so 
that the orbiter fills the frame in a clockwise format. If we shot straight normal, the top would be out, out of the frame and the bottom would be out of the frame. And then the camera on the bottom right is a 70 millimeter overall view with a 100 inch lens. The tracker operator, you can see he's sitting there in the seat. He's looking through the tracking scope and he's actually tracking the orbiter through his scope with all the cameras foresighted to that point. On this slide, we were imaging something that w was not a launch. Uh, there was a NASA satellite called L-Cross that was to impact the moon. And we were going to try to see if we could image the satellite crashing into the moon. You see an IR camera on the right side and uh, HD on 150 inch lens on the left. If you look close, notice what I'm wearing. That's a mosquito suit. Uh, Florida weather promotes mosquitoes. and. Uh, it's not much you can do to keep them off of you. Uh, we, we sat out there all night to image this, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't see anything. We, we thought we might, but I guess the moon's a little bit further away than, than uh, looking down the road. In this slide, you'll see I'm just... Uh, loading the film, checking the camera, and, and uh, making sure everything's all right. We set the frame rates and uh, different shutter speeds for the cameras prior to launch based on the lighting conditions. And this one looks like a full daylight setup, which are, is pretty standard. This slide was uh, taken right after Columbia. We were showcasing our equipment and trying to determine what we needed to go forth on the return to flight post Columbia. Uh, this is Rick Weatherington and myself. Uh, we're going to track a, a Delta IV rocket and we're just comparing notes. We're sitting up and, and talking about uh, what we're going to see and where we're going to track and typically when we do a setup like this one of us will track the uh, engines and one will track the nose cone and that way with that tight fields of view on both of, or all of these cameras, um, we can give a good full coverage of the rocket. This picture here is a picture of myself standing up in the tracker. What you're looking at here is a Kinetto tracking mount. If you start on the far left of the photograph, you see on the top of the platform, and if you notice the platforms have slots on top and bottom. You could mount multiple cameras, you can hang them upside down. There's a number of ways you can mount cameras to these mounts. Right here what we have on the left is a 120 inch lens. In the middle, first you see a square box. That is what the tracker operator uses as a wide angle acquisition. It's got a crosshair in it and it kind of sees the world. You look through there and you get close to your, your subject and then you switch over to the short optics there. That gives you a mid-range type of focal length and then once you get on track there you can switch over to the long-range telescope in the center and that gives you a tight end view which optimizes your track. And then over on the right hand side of the photograph is a 100 inch contrivance lens it's probably a film camera on the back. I can't see the camera. We were just comparing different focal lengths as image sizes and uh, what kind of quality we would get out of these long lenses. This slide is a, is a, a good representation of, of some of the fixed camera sites that we have here on the Eastern Range. And what they do is they track optically, but they provide azimuth elevation data back to the uh, master computer for range safety. They rely on the operator's sense of where he's tracking to tell the range safety people that this is exactly where this rocket is. They have several of these around the uh, Cape and what they do is they, all the data comes back and they use the data from the different trackers to triangulate the position of, of the rocket at any given time. This particular one is located north of the pad up at Playa Linda Beach and it's actually called Playa Linda Beach Domes. Uh, it's a dual telescope. It's a two meter and a five meter telescope as you can see in the picture. And this whole dome turns with the telescope. So as the operator's tracking, this dome will slew left and right and you could see the elevation allowed to go straight up to 90 degrees.